Coming into the start of the NBL 24 season, all 10 teams were poised to make a big run at the championship with huge signings and huge expectations across the board. For back-to-back NBL champions, the Sydney Kings, and championship runners-up, the New Zealand Breakers, both would enter the season aiming to capitalise on their winning momentum, albeit with somewhat revamped rosters. And for the Kings, a new coach, their fifth in the last six seasons. There were expectations everywhere for the Sydney Kings for a three-peat. They lost their whole starting five, but really made a splash in the free agents market in the off-season. They lose Xavier Cooks and MVP, bring back a former MVP in Jalen Adams, probably the story of the off-season, partner him with one of the best players we saw last season in DJ Hogue, and already things are starting to take shape for the Sydney Kings. They just needed some other pieces around. They bring back Jonah Bolden out of retirement. Everybody had a bit of a question mark there. How is Jonah Bolden going to come with such a long time away from the game? And then Den- Denzel Valentine comes with an NBA pedigree, wanted to get back to the NBA, and all of a sudden that starting five combined with the core unit that was already there and had led them to two championships. Things look really good in the Harbour City for a three-peat title run. New Zealand retooled over the off-season. They got three brand new imports, Parker Jackson, Cartwright, Zylan Cheatham. They brought Justinian Jessup back. Really importantly, they re-signed Will McDowell White and brought in an exciting next star, Lithuanian Mantas Rupstevicius. So for both teams that were in the championship series last year, on paper, they look set to have a deep run into the playoffs. Last season's playoff contenders, the Cairns Taipans, Tasmania Jack Jumpers, South East Melbourne Phoenix and Perth Wildcats all retooled their rosters to build on successful campaigns that they hoped would position themselves as strong contenders for NBL 24. The Taipans were one win away from the championship series last year. So close, had such a great run, but they lost a couple of key pieces during the off season. Keanu Pinder, the man in the middle, he goes to Perth and they lose DJ Ho, the import signing with the Sydney Kings. But of course we know Adam Ford, he's a great recruiter and he likes to bring in young talent. So he goes out in the off-season and he brings in Taron Armstrong, exciting young Aussie point guard. Sam Menenga from New Zealand. He re-signs Bull Kual, who's an important piece for them, especially at the defensive end. Next star, Bobby Clintman, 6'10", power forward out of Sweden, comes into the lineup, and he goes and finds strong, talented point guard import, Pat Miller. Tasmania looked to Scott Roth and the culture he's built to continue their winning ways. The biggest name they needed in the off-season to keep was Milton Doyle. They got his name down for two more seasons, alongside Will Magne, who's had his injury problems, but they know what he's capable of if he could stay healthy. And then Jack McVeigh, one of the most promising locals. And then it was all about getting some other pieces around. They went and got Marcus Lee, an import from Melbourne United, who showed some great signs, just a partner with Will Magne in the front court and then got one of the most prolific scorers in the world outside of the NBA in Jordan Crawford. He's a pocket dynamo just to see what he could do in the NBL season. And they re-signed Sean McDonald who turned down offers from other clubs, but they had high expectations on what he could do for the Jack Jumpers this season. The South East Melbourne Phoenix made the play-in tournament last year, but they fell over at the first hurdle. So they retooled over the off season on and off the floor. They changed their head coach. That was the big move. They let go Simon Mitchell and they bring in Mike Kelly, who of course won a championship with the South East Melbourne Magic back in the day. They had some success with some of their imports in NBL 23, so they bring two of them back, Alan Williams and Gary Brown, and they signed former French League MVP, Will Cummings. And of course, all those pieces that are support superstar Mitch Creek, who's back in the lineup. There's always pressure on Perth to perform. After losing in the playing game the season prior, they needed to come back with a bang. They lost their homegrown talent, everybody's favourite, their fan favourite in Luke Travers. They made big moves in free agency when they went and got Keanu Pinder. Outside of Will McDowell White, he was the big name, the big local everybody wanted to get. Keanu Pinder returning home to Perth. They went out and got Christian Doolittle and Jordan Usher, two really strong defensively minded imports to try and partner alongside the greatness of Bryce Cotton. And then potentially the number one draft pick in Alex Saar, who joined the Next Stars program out of France. While for the teams that languished at the bottom of the ladder last season, Melbourne United, Adelaide 36ers, Brisbane Bullets and the Illawarra Hawks, it was Melbourne United who created the biggest noise in the off-season, cementing themselves as early championship favourites. Well, Melbourne United missed the playoffs last season, the play-in tournament, the finals, all of it. 
So Dean Vickerman goes into the offseason looking to retool and he wants to go back to a high level Aussie core. He's got Chris Golding, all NBL second team, a superstar. He's got next star Ariel Hook 40 coming back from injury. And he just goes whack, whack in the offseason. He gets Matthew Della Vadova back, Luke Travers from Perth, and he signs Joe Luala Chul back from China. Outstanding local Aussie pieces. And then he goes and gets an NBA and NBL champion, Ian Clark, as the import off the bench. The teams that really battled last season had to make some big changes. They were Adelaide, Brisbane and Illawarra. The Adelaide 36ers went out and got Isaac Humphries, trusting that if his body stayed healthy, he'd be a premier big man in the competition. DJ Vasiljevic, one of the most promising locals, came a little later in the season, but they brought over Trey Kell, who they thought they could unlock something special from the South East Melbourne Phoenix to join the 36ers. And then the Brisbane Bullets, really tough season the year before. So much happened off the court that was out of their control and they had to turn things around. They went out and got Justin Schuler, assistant coach for from Melbourne United to try and get the culture right in the Bullets and then they needed to get some pieces to put alongside Nathan Sobey and Aaron Baines. They went and got Shannon Scott out of Cairns, terrific import who played really well for Cairns the season before and Chris Smith, a prolific sharpshooter who was just playing in Japan and all of a sudden things look good for Brisbane up north. And the Illawarra Hawks, the worst season in the history of the franchise, just three games won the season before and they wanted to turn things around in dramatic fashion. They went and got Gary Clark. He's an NBA level talent. They thought he was going to be a perfect piece to go alongside Sam Froling and Tyler Harvey who are already there. And Hyung Jong Lee said in the off season, said at Summer League he was going to be the best shooter in the competition. So everybody was keen to watch to see how he would go. And then everybody seemed to forget. Justin Robinson was still around for Illawarra. Missed all of last season with a knee injury. He's an NBA level talent. What could this team put together with such talents and pieces? The beginning of NBL 24 saw stars and high hopes across the court, but talent on paper doesn't always translate into wins, and the pressure to win early was huge. While early season expectations were high off the court, the reality for some teams showed there was plenty of work to be done. With championship contenders, the Perth Wildcats failing to find early wins, there was pressure mounting on star guard Bryce Cotton and head coach John Rilly. The story to the start of the season was the pressure for the big teams to perform. And the biggest name on everybody's lips was the Perth Wildcats. They had all the biggest splashes in the off season and they struggled early on. Bryce Cotton was a shell of himself, averaging just 14 points per game through the first seven, which meant they were eighth after round five, just two wins, and all the Red Army, all the media wanted some answers. Keanu Pinder wasn't playing to the level that they expected, and everybody wanted to know what was happening. John Rilly's name was in every headline, on every Red Army member's lips, and they wanted results, they wanted things to happen, and they needed them to happen quickly. Enter King Cotton. The Wildcats, well, they turn it all around. They finish the first half of the season with six wins and one loss over the course of seven games. Bryce is playing at an all-time level. He's averaging 27 a game. He's pouring on the points, puts 41 on Sydney at home. They have a huge overtime win in Melbourne with Jordan Usher showing all the emotion. John really breathes a huge sigh of relief at this point because the pressure's off him a little bit. And Alexander Saar, their next star from France, after a terrific beginning of the season, continues to play well and establishes himself as the projected number one pick in the upcoming NBA draft. For the New Zealand Breakers, injuries started to mount early. After starting the first two games of the season, import guard Justinian Jessup was ruled out indefinitely with a pelvic injury, while import big man Zylan Cheatham fractured his foot in round five. New Zealand Breakers were decimated with injuries to begin their season. Import guard Justinian Jessup ruled out for the remainder of NBL 24 with a pelvic injury. And then stars Island Cheatham and Will McDowell White were set to miss some time. And next up, Montes Rubstavichis also under an injury cloud. They were hoping they could pull it together in the second half of the season. If they were going to do that, they were going to need Parker Jackson Cartwright to lead the way. Silver lining to those injury issues meant they could go and get an NBA level talent in Anthony Lamb. 
who partnered with Parker Jackson Cartwright. They had hoped they could try and steady the ship until everybody else came back. But after round 10, they had just four wins and nine losses and needed a big second half of the season if they wanted to get back to the championship series. Two other teams struggling to find early season form were the Illawarra Hawks and Adelaide 36ers. For the Hawks, coming off a three-win season, there was hope they'd be more competitive. But at the end of round seven, with a two and seven record, they would fire their head coach, Jacob Jacomis. Man, it was a tough start to the season for the Hawks. Um, the imports weren't firing to the level that they could produce. They didn't seem to have much chemistry. They just weren't winning. Two wins from their first nine games, it wasn't enough. So that's when they made the tough decision to let Jacob Jacomis go. A change of head coach. Enter Justin Tatum, Jason Tatum's dad, the NBA superstar and all-star. He was assistant coach, now he's head coach. And all of a sudden, this team started to find their mojo. They go over to New Zealand, they win there, they beat Perth, and then they suffer just a one-point loss to Brisbane. At this point, at the end of round 10, the Hawks were starting to look like they could turn this thing around. The Adelaide 36ers and their head coach, CJ Bruton, also came into the season hoping to turn things around after missing five straight postseason. But an 0-4 start to the season and a 4-9 and record after round nine, the 36ers fired Bruton after a humiliating 35-point loss to the Jack Jumpers in Tasmania. It was going to be a challenge from the start for CJ Bruton. Jamal Franklin, the import guard, signed in the offseason. They parted ways with before the season even began, and they tried to turn things around with the signing of DJ Vasiljevic. He spent some time with the Washington Wizards on an Exhibit 10 deal, wanted to return home to the NBL, but was still technically had to go to the Sydney Kings. After a lot of talk back and forth, he was released from the Sydney Kings, and the Adelaide 36ers gave him the keys to the franchise going forward, hoping they could turn things around. After the poor start and a really poor showing down in Tasmania, Adelaide had to make a decision. They chose to part ways with CJ Bruton and bring in a beloved character of the Adelaide 36ers franchise in Scott Ninnis, named as the interim head coach, hoping to turn things around in the second half of the season. Scott Ninnis had been there before as a head coach of the Adelaide 36ers, lives and breathes the 36ers franchise and was hoping that they could bring some renewed energy to this franchise going forward. While some teams languished at the bottom of the ladder at the midpoint of the season, other teams were thriving. Melbourne United, Tasmania Jack Jumpers, South East Melbourne Phoenix and the Sydney Kings occupied the top four spots on the ladder, while the up and down Cairns Taipans and Brisbane Bullets jostled for a spot in the top six. Well, Melbourne United were flying. What a start to the season they had. Barely losing a game, sitting on top of the ladder throughout the first half of the season. They didn't have Joe Luala Chul, mind you, so they were doing it without their starting centre. But Ariel hook Porty stepped up. The next star from Germany. I mean, he was leading the league in rebounds and blocks throughout most of that time. And his draft stocks were soaring back on NBA draft boards. And of course, Chris Golding was on fire, uh, lighting it up from long range, and he was an early front runner for MVP. Tasmania would enter the halfway point of the season in second place, nine wins and five losses, with those five losses coming by just an average of four and a half points per game. Scott Roth had this team firing on all cylinders on the offensive end, led by point guard Dynamo Jordan Crawford. They were putting up some big numbers on the opposition, and things were looking really positive down in the Apple Isle. The South East Melbourne Phoenix had a bit of a rough start to the year. They didn't have their star import centre, Alan Williams. He was out injured. They had a replacement who was exciting, Tyler Cook, but even he went down with injury. So they started one win from their first four games. At that point, though, Alan Williams came back and they found their rhythm. All of a sudden, by the end of round 10, they were sitting inside the top four. They're in third place with a nine and six record. At that point though, their season took another twist and turn. They start the second half of the year by sacking Will Cummings for not doing everything he needed to do off the floor and they bring in former NBA player Abdel Nader. But the signs were that their season was starting to slide away. Well, the back-to-back -back champions were looking really good at the start of the season. We thought it might take a little while for them to come together, but they were clicking early. They won seven of their first 10 games. Jalen Adams was rolling. The former MVP is putting up 20 a game in the early going. And Jonah Bolden, the former NBA player, comes back and he's playing really well to start the season. 
But then all of a sudden things started to go awry. They won just one of their next four games and they hit round 10 with some grumblings about their defense, starting to look a little shaky and not the Sydney Kings team we're used to seeing. For Cairns early on in the start of the season, it was all inconsistency. They had their trip overseas to play in the NBA preseason games, but they had injuries, sickness, a whole lot of things to deal with with a bunch of new faces, and they just couldn't figure it out on the floor. To Jim McCall, the heart and soul of the Taipans, missed some time first through injury and then through the birth of his first child as well. And with all of that, they really struggled to kind of find an identity. But enter Patrick Miller the import guard who was signed initially as a sixth man to Taron Armstrong, all of a sudden in the first half of the season was an MVP candidate player playing at an unbelievably high level and arguably the brightest spark around the NBL. The Brisbane Bullets got off to a dream start, winning their first game under Justin Schuller and then the wheels kind of fell off. They lost their next five. There was a suspension to Aaron Baines who missed five games after an incident with Adam Ford and Lat Main of the Cairns type ends. And they had some big question marks going forward about how they turned things around. Nathan Sobey got off to a flyer, playing at an MVP caliber level, but he just needed some other players to come along with him to try and turn this thing around. Their import guards in Chris Smith and Shannon Scott were inconsistent in trying to help him turn things around. So they're hovering around that sixth spot, just hoping that things in the second half of the season would become better. halfway point of the season, the title race was wide open. But it was a turning point for the South East Melbourne Phoenix. After sacking import guard Will Cummings, the Phoenix went into free fall and would go on to win just two of their last 14 games. It was a tough second half of the season for the Phoenix. Injury bug bit them hard. Alan Williams missing games, Mitch Creek missing games, Gary Brown missing games. You throw in there some of their role players like Craig Moller and Gorjok Gak missing a chunk of the season with injury. And they were piling on the losses as a result. Uh, Abdel Nader, he, he didn't really have the opportunity to find his feet. And as a result, they slid down the site, the standings, and didn't make the postseason. And while the finals were being played, well, they were already in rebuild mode. They announced that they're parting ways with star centre Alan Williams as they look towards NBL 25. While South East Melbourne would anchor themselves to the bottom of the ladder, the Adelaide 36ers showed new energy and fight under interim coach Scott Ninnis. After a tough start in charge, winning just one of his first five games, Adelaide would finish the season as one of the hottest teams in the league. And then out of nowhere, the Adelaide 36ers turned it all around. The wind started to come in, the Adelaide 36ers fans were up and about. Led by DJ Vasilievich and Isaac Humphries, this team went on an enormous run to finish the NBL 24 season. They were anchored at the bottom of the ladder for the majority of the year. And then all of a sudden, not only were they winning games, they were a chance to play finals, which a lot of people thought was impossible considering the way they began the season. Scott Ninnis had done his job. He'd got this team turned around and they were looking to the future. While they fell short of their ultimate goal in playing playoff basketball, they locked in long-term deals for Dion Vasilievich, Isaac Humphries, and head coach Scott Ninnis, so things are looking very positive in the future for the Adelaide 36ers. Entering the second half of the season, the Cairns Taipans looked a threat on any given night, with star import guard Patrick Miller in conversations for the MVP and the continued rise of NBL next star Bobby Clintman, the Taipans were still in the hunt to play finals deep into the season. But ultimately, their up and down play sealed their fate, finishing in eighth place. The Cairns Taipans were a roller coaster ride this season, so up and down. At times, they were world beaters, beating Melbourne United on multiple occasions. And then at other times, they just couldn't seem to piece consecutive wins together. Pat Miller was excellent. What an import signing he was. Uh, but their other import, to Jim McCall, things just didn't seem quite right with him and coach Adam Ford late in the season. That said, there were a couple of bright spots. Taron Armstrong, well, he's going to be a terrific player, a young Aussie point guard who is going to be big for them next year. And Bobby Clintman, the next star from Sweden, he had a terrific campaign and he's ending the season as a projected first round pick 
in the upcoming NBA draft. But towards the back end of the season, they still had a chance. They'd done enough to stay in the mix, but ultimately they couldn't quite get it done and they finished just a little short of the play. After early season struggles, the Brisbane Bullets' hopes of playing in the postseason looked promising. Sitting in fourth position on the ladder after round 16, having won five of their last six games, the Bullets were primed to end their four-year postseason drought. But a late slump had the Bullets heading into their final game of the season, facing elimination. Brisbane were up and down in the second half of the season, losing three straight, then winning five straight, and then juggling some wins and losses to finish out NBL 24. They had a chance to play finals basketball, and it all came down to round 20. They had to go over to New Zealand, win, and they were in. New Zealand had a lot to play for as well, and unfortunately for the Bullets, they just couldn't get it done. They fell short and their season was over. It means they enter the off-season with a lot of question marks around some contracts going forward for NBL 25. What happens with Aaron Baines' contract? What happens to the imports of Chris Smith and Shannon Scott? But things are in a positive place after the first season for Justin Schuller. He has the culture turned around, and I think things are heading in the right direction for the Brisbane Bullets. To begin the second half of the season, the New Zealand Breakers welcomed back injured import Zylan Cheatham and would reel off four straight wins to sit sixth on the ladder. But after dropping the next three games to Perth, Melbourne and Sydney, the Breakers would find themselves in familiar territory sitting in ninth. No one wanted to play New Zealand late in the season. Mantas Rupstevichis came into the starting lineup, their season turned around, everyone was playing at a high level. Unfortunately, Anthony Lamb snapped his Achilles, so the injury bug bit them again, but others were stepping up. Parker Jackson Cartwright was playing at a really high level. So as they entered the final round of the season, they needed just one of their final two games to make the play-in, and they get it. They're going to appear in the postseason. Back-to-back -back defending champions, the Sydney Kings would start the second half of the season slowly. After a big win against Tasmania, the Kings would drop five of their next six games. With plenty of questions being asked of coach Mahmoud Abdel Fattah, the Kings would sit just outside the top six, heading into the final round of the season. Back into the season and the question's getting louder and louder for the Sydney Kings. Coach Mahmoud Abdul Fattah, he had a lot of things to answer for. They just couldn't string it together. Their defensive inconsistencies were a big problem. They just could not get enough stops. They had an unfathomable loss to an undermanned South East Melbourne Phoenix that really kick-started a trend that a lot of Sydney Kings fans thought they might not get out of. But it all came down to round 20. DJ Hogue had been missing a few games here and there, but they had finally had a full roster to go into round 20, needing to beat the Phoenix, get some revenge on that loss, and then make the play-in tournament. They did it in style. They came out, put them to the sword early. 55-point win in round 20 to get them fifth spot in the play-in tournament. And all the fans are wondering, maybe this was a chance the Kings could have a run at a three-peat. Led by their new coach, Justin Tatum, the Illawarra Hawks' fortunes would dramatically change in the second half of the season. After spending the majority of the first half on the bottom of the ladder, the Hawks would rise to fifth place by round 14. And by round 20, they were one win away from securing a top four spot. The turnaround for the Illawarra Hawks under Justin Tatum was really, really impressive. They were down, done and dusted when he came in and he turned them completely around. He got them defending at a high level. He really unlocked Gary Clark, which was a huge key to their season because you know, he became one of the best players in the league. He started to get consistent, high-level play out of Sam Froling, one of the best local bigs in the competition. And he moved Justin Robinson, the import point guard, to the bench, which ended up being a smart move. It started to get the best out of Justin Robinson. Incredible performance from Tatum, becomes a coach of the year candidate. And this team coming into the final round of the season had a chance to lock in a final spot. They're playing Perth at home, Melbourne United on the road. Now, no easy feat because they're the top two teams in the league and they just needed one win and they got it. They took care of the Wildcats, overcame Bryce Cotton and locked themselves into the postseason. The winning culture of the Jack Jumpers under head coach Scott Roth would continue in the second half of the season. Led by stars Milton Doyle and Jack McVeigh, and with the emergence of development player Sean McDonald, Tasmania would finish the season in third place, and in doing so, lock in their third straight NBL Finals appearance. 
Towards the back end of the season, it's deja vu for Tasmania Jack Jumpers. Once again, they find themselves playing some of their best basketball as the business end really heats up. This is what the Jack Jumpers do. The games they lose, they're losing just. The games they win, they can put teams away and they do it in style. The culture that Scott Roth has created is unlike any other team in the NBL. No matter what happens, they're always in with a chance to win every single game. They're the most mentally resilient and toughest team going around. Led by their superstars, Jordan Crawford, Jack McVay, Milton Doyle, and a surprise packet in Sean McDonald, this team you do not want to face come finals. After the halfway point of the season, it became a two-horse race for top spot on the NBL ladder. Melbourne United and the resurgent Perth Wildcats. United would spend 19 rounds at the top of the ladder, while the Wildcats wouldn't relinquish second place for the final nine rounds of the season. Heading into the NBL playoffs, both teams were predicted to meet in the NBL Championship Series. Geez, Melbourne United was so impressive over the course of the regular season. Sitting in top spot from round two all the way through to round 20. Didn't lose two games in a row at any stage over the course of that schedule. Dean Vickerman was terrific. What a great coach. Coach of the year candidate without a shadow of a doubt. And his squad, collectively and individually, played at a really high level. Chris Golding leading the way, shooting the ball at a very high clip, playing at an all NBL level. So was Joe Luala Chul as their big man in the middle. Look at a guy like Luke Travers. What a terrific regular season he had. Shea Yearly, definite defensive player of the year candidate. And of course, Matthew Delavadova leading the way at the point guard position. So you look at them coming into the finals and you say they're ready. They're primed to make a run at this title. And next to them on the standings, one rung down, the Perth Wildcats. After a tough start to the season, turn themselves around emphatically. What a terrific second half of the year they had. John really is to be congratulated on the job of turning that season around. Led of course by Bryce Cotton, who without a shadow of a doubt is the best player in the league this year. Definite front runner, if not out and out favorite to be the MVP. And other guys stepping up as well. Christian Doolittle, defensive player of the year candidate. And you've got to be impressed with Alex Saar, who has sat as a projected one, two, a top pick in the upcoming NBA draft throughout the season. So whilst they're a little shaky at the very end of this regular season, they've done enough, both these teams, to lock in a top two spot and give themselves home court advantage when the playoffs arrive in that three game series. With Melbourne and Perth locked in to the top two spots, they advanced straight to the playoffs. So, all attention would turn to the play-in tournament. Kicking off night one of the finals, Illawarra travelled to Tasmania for the opportunity to advance and meet Perth in the playoffs. Well, Tasmania looked like they were ready for business. They come in to start the postseason, the play-in game there against Illawarra. And they just tore it up right from the very get-go, got out to an early lead. Jack McVeigh, really impressive. 26 points, 11 rebounds. Very, very solid performance by McVeigh, but it was Will Magne who was the star of the show. For the entire time he was on the floor, it's gonna be hard to find a better individual performance with what he did on both ends. 25 points, 10 rebounds, four blocks. It was one of the best performances you'll see on the big stage from a player in the NBL. Magne in that game put in one of, if not the most dominant performances by any player over the course of this season in a big moment to send the Jack Jumpers in the final four. This was a taking care of business performance from Tasmania. Now they set up a semi-final series against the Perth Wildcats and we get to see who Illawarra will face. But Tasmania have made a statement here in game one of the play-in tournament. With Tasmania holding on to their third seed, they would now go on to face Perth in the playoffs. In the first elimination game of the postseason, it would be a rematch of last season's championship series. With the Breakers seeking retribution, they would head into Sydney with plenty to play for. As for the Kings, their confidence was sky high, 
having blown out the breakers in their last meeting late in the season. Heading to Kudos Bank Arena for the playing game with the Kings and the Breakers, a championship rematch, and everyone thought the momentum was probably with Sydney after the 55-point win to end the regular season. They beat the Breakers the last time they played by 29. The way they started, there was good signs for the Sydney Kings. The best part of this matchup is that it's the championship rematch. These two teams, Sydney and New Zealand, went to a five-game series to decide the championship last year, and here they are battling it out in the postseason trying to stay alive and there's pressure on the Kings. I mean, there's pressure on the defending champs. There's pressure on the coach, Mahmoud Abdel Fattah, because you know, they need to win this game to keep their championship defense alive. And you know, for many people feel like he's kind of coaching for his season in this big moment. And of course, remember the, the New Zealand Breakers, they don't have their best player out there on the floor. Anthony Lamb, the ruptured Achilles tendon, he's sitting on the sidelines. And the Kings come out strong. You know, they, they play well in the first half in front of their home fans. They're leading at halftime by almost double digits and things are looking pretty good. But the resilience of this Breakers team comes to the fore in the second half. Whatever Mori Mayo said to the New Zealand Breakers during that halftime break, it worked. And Parker Jackson Cartwright, he came out and just dominated the second half. The Sydney Kings, again, the questions we had all season long about their defense faltered when it mattered most and nobody could contain PJC. The pocket dynamo for the Breakers was spectacular. 34 points, five rebounds, six assists, player of the game performance. And he told Derek Rucker about it post game. He'd ranked him a little lower than Parker Jackson Cartwright liked in his player ratings heading towards the postseason. And Jackson Cartwright in that big moment told Rucker all about it. Towards the end of the game, he had a few things to say to Derek Rucker in the commentary box afterwards, and I think that kind of showed where his head was at. And he means business, and he's coming for more than just a play and win. With the Breakers advancing and the Hawks getting their second chance, having finished in the top four, the two teams would meet in an elimination game with the winner advancing to play Melbourne United in the playoffs. Well, it was the Hawks who came out firing to begin this one. They get out to a double-digit lead inside the first quarter in front of their home fans and it looked like they were just going to blow this game apart but really strong bounce back from New Zealand in the second quarter and we're all tied up at half time. The third quarter was back and forth, the Hawks go into the fourth quarter up three just 10 minutes away from a semi-final series berth against Melbourne United. And what a game this turned out to be down the stretch. The final quarter had 10 lead changes. Big time players stepping up in big moments. Sam Froling was huge for Illawarra with the 20 and 10. And Justin Robinson, after coming off the bench midway through this season, scores 24 of his 26 points in the second half. Big time clutch free throws down the stretch, gives the Hawks the advantage. The Breakers still have one last opportunity. The Breakers need a three to tie and send this to overtime and they're going to live and die by their number one man, Parker Jackson Cara, who lets it fly, but unfortunately it's just not meant to be. And it comes off, which means the Hawks are going to face Melbourne United in a semi-final series. And it's the end of the New Zealand Breakers run, who had a tough season with injuries, but where they managed to get to says a lot about Modi Mayor and the club. The dream is over. They were brave, they were impressive in the postseason, but their season is finished. and. So is the career now of Tom Abercrombie, the legendary New Zealand breaker who's won all those championships, their all-time leader in so many statistical categories. His jersey is headed to the rafters of Spark Arena and we're not going to see him on the hardwood in the NBL anymore. What a champion. With the playoffs now set, the fairy tale run of the Illawarra Hawks look to continue. But facing a dominant Melbourne United who hadn't dropped back-to-back -back games all season, it was shaping up to be a tough series. We head to a semi-final series, Melbourne United versus the Illawarra Hawks. A bit of a David Goliath about this with Melbourne being the benchmark all season long. Melbourne, the presumptive favourites. They've been on top of the ladder all year. And Illawarra, well, they look like their season was done halfway through the year and Justin Tatum has got them now into this big moment. Big time matchups right across the series, right? Look right at the center spot, Joe Luala Chul, Sam Froling, elite local big men going head to head. Chris Golding, runner up MVP, all NBL first team. And on the other side, a guy like Tyler Harvey, 
who we know steps up and puts points on the board. The Hawks at the power forward spot have Gary Clark, who's an All-NBL first team performer. And his matchup is going to be Luke Travis, who has had a sensational season over the course of the year. Whilst everybody expects Melbourne United to advance, the Hawks are going to show them trouble. They've played well against Melbourne through their matchups in the regular season, and everything is set up. At three quarter time, the Hawks are up 10 in John Kane Arena in enemy territory, and everybody was thinking they could potentially steal one on the road against the favorites to win it all in Melbourne United. During the fourth quarter, it was a 16 point margin towards the Illawarra Hawks, and they were in the driver's seat. And it looks like they're gonna shock the world and go one up on Melbourne United. But it was at that moment that everything turned on its head. United comes storming home. Hawks up two, sideline out of bounds. They just need to get the ball in bounds and close this game out. Kyle Adnam throws the ball in and it's a turnover. Delhi finds Chris Golding. He takes the long way round it on Justin Robinson and he gets to the cup and finishes the play. All of a sudden, scores are tied and unbelievably, we're going to overtime. And then Melbourne United decided to flex some muscles in that extra period of five minutes. They put the Hawks to the sword, went up one in the series, heading back to Illawarra, feeling good about themselves. And on the flip side for Illawarra, they let one slip. One inbounds pass away from potentially stealing one on the road would have changed a whole lot, you'd think, going forward. The challenge for the Hawks heading into game two was to keep their head up. It was at game one, they had it. They let it slip through their fingers. But the series is still alive and they're playing on their home court. And this was a terrific game. I mean, so close, nip and tuck the entire way. The third quarter alone had 14 lead changes. And in the dying few minutes, well, it was wild. Both teams had their opportunities to, to get the advantage. And it came down to the final play of regulation. Gary Clark comes up short, but there's Dave O'Hickey, an unbelievable performance throughout the entire game. Career high 18 points, gets an offensive rebound, put back, and once again, in the matter of two games, we're going to overtime between these two clubs, nothing separating them. And in overtime, well, the Hawks this time had the advantage. In front of their home fans, they made all the big plays, and they got the win. Gary Clark was enormous, 31 points and 16 rebounds for the star import. And Dave O'Hickey, wow, a career-high 18 points, including the season-saving bucket for the Hawks to send it to overtime. And now we're going to a game three. Pressure's back on Melbourne United and the Cinderella story that are the Illawarra Hawks, well, their season's alive. Heading into game three, United would look to capitalise on having home court advantage. While the Hawks are coming off a three win season last year, hope to extend their fairy tale run. Do or die, game three between these two teams. And Melbourne United started to flex a little bit of muscle at times, but the Illawarra Hawks just wouldn't go away. You knew the emotion, the fairy tale, everything they'd accomplished, they weren't going to back down no matter what was thrown at them. To their credit, Melbourne United came out to begin game three locked in. They get an early lead, it's exactly what they needed. And Illawarra, they're forced to play catch up for most of this game. Shea Ely was huge. Man, what a performance from, from him. We know him as a defender, but he stepped up at the offensive end in big moments. Tyler Harvey hits a three late to cut it to four, but it was all too late. Melbourne United's quality, the top team all season, came to the fore in this game three, and they advanced to the championship series. And for Illawarra, well, the opportunity is missed and their season is over, but a lot to be proud of. A lot to be excited about moving forward. They've re-signed their head coach, Justin Tatum. They've got a really strong local core to build on at moving into the future. So big ups to the Hawks on turning their season around and, and having a great year. On the other side of the bracket, the Perth Wildcats would face the Tasmania Jack Jumpers. With home court advantage and recently crowned four-time NBL MVP Bryce Cotton, the Wildcats would come into the series as favourites. But as always, Scott Roth's men, including all NBL second team representatives Milton Doyle and Jack McVeigh, would be ready to defend their island. What a tantalising matchup in this semi-final series, Perth and Tasmania. Perth, of course, top two finish. They've got home court advantage. 
the Jack Jumpers, well, they're the form team in the competition, playing at a really high level to finish the regular season and then smack Dillawarra to advance to this spot. Jeez, this was a physical contest throughout the entire 40 minutes, and that's what you expect in a semi-final series, but the difference was Keanu Pinder. Five of seven from three. We know we didn't get to see him in the postseason last year because of a fractured eye socket, and he really stepped up and took his opportunity in game one, and he was the difference maker. The start of the fourth quarter, the Jack Jumpers, they come out firing. Jack McVeigh wakes up. Back-to-back -back threes from McVeigh, and the Jack Jumpers are up six. Timeout Wildcats. It feels like it's the game deciding move from the Jack Jumpers. But Perth respond on their home floor. Big plays from Keanu Pinder down the stretch. Huge plays from Ty Webster. Hustle plays on the deck. A big three from Webster in the corner. And the Wildcats do enough to claim game one. In a game that got a little crazy down the stretch with a big foul from Marcus Lee on Jordan Usher, the Wildcats take the chocolates and they go one up in the series. When I go home for Tasmania in game two, in their home, My State Bank Arena, the fans are ready to roll, but Tasmania weren't. These two teams don't like each other. This fan base, not happy with the Wildcats. Marcus Lee sitting on the sidelines now, suspended. But in amongst all of that, it was the Wildcats who came out strong. They start well. They're up 12 early in the second quarter. Keanu Pender, well, he wasn't looking right, and he wasn't able to have his usual impact. I tell you who did look good though was Milton Doyle. After halftime, it was all about Milton Doyle. 15 points in the third quarter alone, and he put Tasmania in the driver's seat to force that extra game back in Perth, but he wasn't alone. Jordan Crawford had struggled so far in this postseason. Sean McDonald, the most improved player in the competition, stepped up when it mattered most, alongside Majuk Deng, who was back from injury, and Tasmania had a nice balanced result in the fourth quarter to get that game three back in Perth. Either Tassie or Perth are going to get through. And it was the Jack Jumpers who stepped up, really dominated this game for most of the night. The key was shutting down Bryce Cotton. If you can limit Bryce Cotton, you can beat the Perth Wildcats. Scott Roth and the Jack Jumpers knew that. They got the ball out of Cotton's hands and they didn't let it come back to him. Whenever Bryce Cotton caught the ball, he saw multiple bodies, he had to get rid of it, and they just struggled to score. But Tasmania never looked like they were going to lose this game after the opening tip. They were in full control, get the job done by 16 points at RAC Arena, and they head back to the championship series for the second time in just the three years they've been part of the NBL. Could they get one step closer to history? And now we have our championship series combatants. Melbourne United versus the Tasmania Jack Jumpers. Melbourne the form team all year. The Jack Jumpers in terrific form late in the season. An expansion team who's going to the championship series for their second time in only their third year of existence. This championship series is gonna be huge. With the championship series set, Melbourne United would be hunting their third title in seven seasons. While for the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, this would be their second championship series appearance in just their third season in the NBL. Well, there's a lot to be excited about with this championship series. Two teams playing at a really high level, all NBL performers on both sides of the coin. Tasmania looking for their first title. Melbourne United looking to add to their championship winning cabinet. This is the matchup that everybody wanted. Although the Perth Wildcats finished second, it's the Tasmania Jack Jumpers who had that mental edge over Melbourne United, who were the benchmark of the competition all season long. And it sets up for a mouth watering championship series. And in game one, well, Melbourne flexed their muscle. It was a tight first quarter. But from then on, it was all United. Joe Luala Chul dominant on the interior with 20 and 10. Chris Golding, six of 10 from long range. He's got his radar locked in. And Ian Clark, the game breaker, comes in off the bench and puts 18 points on the board. 
The jack jumpers looked a little sluggish after their tough series against the Wildcats and a bunch of travel. It looks a little ominous with Melbourne United running away with a 23 point win. And we're starting to wonder, are they going to sweep their way through this series? After Melbourne emerged with a 23-point win in Game 1, Tasmania would find themselves with their backs against the wall. After a somewhat uncharacteristic performance by the Jack Jumpers, they would head back home to My State Bank Arena to defend their island and rally against a formidable United lineup. Well, the pressure's all on Tasmania coming into Game 2. You don't want to go down 2-zip in a five-game series, especially against a team like Melbourne, who have not lost two games in a row. It was a tight contest in the first 20 minutes, back and forth action. It was very physical. After what we saw in game one, the first 20 minutes of game two were very similar. But after half time, Melbourne United just came out and flexed some muscle. Out to double digit lead midway through the third quarter and my State Bank Arena crowd was stunned. Could this be the end of the line for the Jack Jumpers? Well, Jack McVeigh had other plans. This was a, a quintessential Jack Jumpers performance because they were down, they looked dead in the water and then their defense came to the fore. They start to lock down United, chip away at the margin. But the spread of scoring was right across the board with McVeigh, Doyle, Crawford, a whole bunch of guys scoring in double figures. And from looking like they were too far down, the Jack Jumpers square the series at one game apiece and the pendulum of pressure swings back to United. With Melbourne letting a 15-point lead slip away in Game 2, they had little time to dwell on the disappointment as they headed back to John Kane Arena for Game 3. However, facing a confident Jack Jumpers team who had tied the series, it was now a best-of-three battle, intensifying the pressure and stakes for both sides. Tasmania, they'd be feeling pretty good about themselves. They got the job done, they did what they had to do at home, and Melbourne United wanting to get back to their winning ways after letting one slip. After the drama of game two, everything's set up for a cracking game three. Tassie, they're full of confidence, coming in ready to snatch home court away from Melbourne United. That said, Melbourne come out strong, playing well, hitting shots in a game that just had all kinds of drama. Controversial calls throughout, tech fouls, unsportsmanlike fouls on the jack jumpers, Marcus Lee, Tasmania's centre, goes down with an injury and all of a sudden Scott Roth needs to shuffle his lineup. With halftime looming, Chris Golding hits a massive buzzer beater to put them up one leading into the big break. And Melbourne United are thinking they could get it done in the next 20 minutes and just be one win away from a championship. And in the fourth quarter, Scott Roth makes a key strategic change. He goes to a small ball lineup with Majuk Deng at the five. He just hit back to back three. Now he attacks Ariel Hook 40 off the bounce and throws it down on the rim. Dean Vickerman goes to Joe Lawala Chul, but he can't stay in front. And one finish from Majuk Deng. Deng has 15 points in the fourth quarter alone to give the Jack Jumpers a chance. Delhi inbounding the ball with Melbourne United up one. All he has to do is get it in. Chris Golding went down, but Milne Doyle saves the ball from going out of bounds and throws it to Jack McVay. Jack McVay heads down the court, a right to left crossover, steps over the center line, pulls up from 45 feet, and hits the game winning three, the greatest shot in NBL history, to grab game three and give the Jack Jumpers the win. Having stumbled at the last hurdle in game four, and witnessing one of the greatest shots in the history of the NBL, United would find themselves in unfamiliar territory, losing two games in a row for the first time this season. Now facing elimination, United would turn to their superstars as they strive to send this series back for a fifth and deciding game. Game four and Tasmania are just one win away from winning a championship and Melbourne United, can they steal back home court advantage and get it done and force a game five? The entire city of Hobart shuts down. There's viewing parties everywhere. Everybody's wanting to see what this Tasmania team can do with just 40 minutes away from potentially winning a title. It's all at stake for Melbourne United in game four. They have to win to keep the series alive. Marcus Lee's ruled out. His knee injury is going to keep him out for the rest of the series. It's a high intensity game. The Ant Army can smell blood in the water and an opportunity to celebrate a championship on their home floor. Jack McVeigh, the hero from game three, 
is killing it. Knocking down shots left and right. Goes on to have 28 points in this game, playing at a really high level. The last three and a half minutes, Tazzy are in the driver's seat. They're up five, Melbourne United are hobbling, Chris Golding's limping around, Luke Travers is struggling a little bit out there, and Melbourne United need to produce a miracle to force a game five. Dean Vickerman calls a timeout, sets up an isolation play for Matthew Delavadova. He goes one-on-one -on -one against Anthony Drimmick, finishes through contact to put United up one and one step closer to forcing a game five. The play is set up from a Juk Deng slip Sean McDonald tries to inbound the ball, but JLA gets a hand on it. Much like Milton Doyle in game three, JLA saves it, throwing the ball to Ian Clark, who has a chance to ice this game at the line. Hits the first, misses the second. All of a sudden, the jack jumpers are on the fly. The ball finds itself in Jack McVeigh's hands, launches the rush three, but this one misses, and we're going to game five. With another dramatic two-point win, Melbourne incredibly forced a decisive fifth and final game of the championship. With both teams ready to leave everything on the court, the stage was truly set for a battle that would go down in NBL history. So it all comes down to this. Game five, the two best words you can have in the NBL. Win and you hoist the championship trophy. Melbourne United, well, they started fast. They get up by 10 early on, and things aren't looking good for the Jack Jumpers. We know Marcus Lee is out injured. Well, now Will Magne is sore, slips in the opening minute, and he's grabbing at his hamstring and hobbling up and down the floor. If it wasn't for Jordan Crawford, Melbourne United might have been blowing this thing out early. He has 19 points in the first quarter in a spectacular display. And after a defensive grind of a second term, Crawford ends up with 27 at half time and despite Melbourne United's very strong play, we're all tied up going into the sheds. The third quarter was tight. You could feel the tension, the emotion between both teams who knew that the time was running out to win a championship. And then the fourth quarter began. Will Magne made some big plays, but Milne Doyle did what we've seen for so long since he's been in the NBL. Made some really clutch plays down the stretch. A couple of floaters, made some big plays and big moments after being relatively quiet for the first three quarters. When Sean McDonald scores a layup with 19 seconds to go, it looks like the Jack Jumpers have got it won. But then Chris Golding banks a three to bring it back within two. And all of a sudden, this thing's not quite done yet. We find ourselves on the sideline yet again. A place that has been problematic for teams inbounding in this series. And another turnover results. Sean McDonald throws it away. Chris Golding gets his fingertips on it. The ball lands with Matthew Delavadova, who has a half court heave for Melbourne United to win a championship down two, and it doesn't go. Tasmania have done it. They are the NBL 24 champions. One of the greatest sports stories you will ever see. Unbelievable finish to a spectacular season.